My name is Stuart Taylor. I'm president of Princetonians for Free Speech. And we and the James Madison program are co-sponsoring this talk by my old friend, Heather MacDonald, who I imagine most of you know by reputation. Uh, after a lot of nagging from me, she decided that the title of her talk would be Diversity, Delusion, Academia After Affirmative Action, unless it's changed since we talked. <laughs> and um, as you may know, this is her most recent book earlier this year, Heather MacDonald, When Race Trumps Merit, How the Pursuit of Equity Sacrifices Excellence, Destroys Beauty, and Threatens Lives. And there are free copies for students outside. Uh, if you take one, we ask that you sign something or other that says you'll look at our stuff, but you don't, you're not, it's not really a binding promise. Um, Heather writes for the Manhattan Institute. She's done a number of distinguished books. I'm not going to go down the list. And she's spoken in a number of uh, distinguished places. And sometimes she draws uh, hostile commentary. Other times she draws uh, a much uh, more friendly commentary. And I'm hoping that will be the case this time. But Heather will determine what happens. And I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Stuart. And I, I still aspire to be a journalist of your rank, so I'm, I'm falling in your footsteps, but never quite catching up. And thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to state some core principles at the onset. Every student enrolled in this university is among the most privileged individuals in human history. And I use the term privilege in a positive sense. Why? Because you have at your fingertips the thing that Faust sold his soul for, knowledge. To be sure, some Princeton students come from more prosperous backgrounds than others. It doesn't matter. Once you are here, everything is available to you on an equal basis. You are surrounded by libraries that would have driven the Renaissance humanists wild with envy and desire. You could read every book that has ever been written. You have access to cutting edge science laboratories, and they are all open to you so long as you put in the effort to learn. You can explore one of the most dramatic of all human developments, the evolution of style. How did literary expression, for example, evolve from medieval allegory to the 19th century realist novel with its acute investigations of individual consciousness? What connects the majestic resplendence of a Mozart symphony to the coruscating ironies of a Mahler symphony? These are urgent questions whose pursuit will bring you closer to an understanding of the range of human experience. And yet, students at campuses across the university, across the country, are all too often being taught to regard the opportunity for knowledge as a source of oppression and to see bigotry where none exists. Where are students getting these views? From a pervasive ideology that has taken over university bureaucracies and many of the disciplines. That ideology holds that the most important thing about a person is his race and sex, and that discrimination based on those characteristics is the defining characteristic of American colleges in particular and American society in general. Students routinely announce their victimhood before an appreciative audience of diversity deanlets and vice provosts who use the occasion to expand their bureaucratic domain. Any student, however, who thinks of himself as oppressed on a college campus is in the grip of a terrible delusion that will encumber him for the rest of his life. The reality is this. There has never been an environment more tolerant towards history's marginalized groups than an American campus. Traits that can still lead to death and warfare in other countries are actively celebrated in academia. Princeton like colleges everywhere, is filled with liberal, well-meaning faculty who want all of their students to succeed. They are not bigots. They are paragons of goodwill. Every faculty hiring search is one concerted effort to find even remotely qualified female and minority candidates who have not been snapped up by other colleges. So fervently do campus administrators across the country desire the presence of so-called students of color that for five decades, they have almost universally employed vast racial preferences in admission. 
whether they will stop doing so in the wake of the Supreme Court's recent ban on race-based admissions remains to be seen. President Eisgruber vowed to continue pursuing racial diversity with, quote, energy, persistence, and a determination to succeed despite what he called the Supreme Court's, quote, regrettable decision. Even with the best of intentions, however, extirpating academia's all-consuming focus on racial identity is gonna be a long slog. Listen to how the student witnesses for the defense in the anti-preferences lawsuit described their applications to the University of North Carolina and Harvard. A black University of North Carolina alumna testified that it was, quote, really important that UNC saw how the, quote, texture of her hair had impacted her upbringing. Really? Are we now that desperate for race-based markers of, of oppression? Why not describe the books that seduced you with the beauty of their language or the scientific discoveries that inflamed your curiosity about the natural world? A black Harvard alumna complained that, quote, to try to not see her race is to try to not see her simply because there is no part of her experience, no part of her journey, no part of her life that has been untouched by her race. The question arises, do we as a society want to be colorblind or not? The answer from so-called progressives is an unequivocal no, even though they also claim that race is not real. Such self-involvement has been taught these students by the entire educational industry. Compare their identity-based solipsism to the West's humanist tradition. That tradition was founded on the all-consuming desire to engage with real difference, the radical difference of the past. The 14th century Florentine poet Francesco Petrarch triggered the explosion of knowledge known today as Renaissance humanism with his discovery of Livy's monumental history of Rome and the letters of Cicero. But Petrarch didn't want to just read the ancients, he wanted to converse with them as well. So he penned heartfelt letters in Latin to Virgil, Seneca, Horace, and Homer, among others, informing them of the fate of their writings and of Rome itself. After rebuking Cicero for the vindictiveness revealed in Cicero's letters, Petrarch repented and wrote him again. I fear that my last letter has offended you but I feel I know you as intimately as if I had always lived with you. The burning drive to recover a lost culture propelled the Renaissance humanists into remote castles and monasteries across Europe to search for long forgotten manuscripts. The knowledge that many ancient texts were forever lost filled these scholars with despair. Nevertheless, they exulted in their growing repossession of classical learning, for which they felt in Ralph Waldo Emerson's words, a canine appetite. In Francois Rabelais' exuberant gargantuous stories from the 1530s, the giant gargantua sends off his son to study in Paris, joyfully conjuring up the languages, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Chaldean, and Arabic, that he expects him to master, as well as the vast range of history, law, natural history, and philosophy. In short, he concludes, let me find you a perfect abyss of knowledge. Why did that humanist tradition, with its passion for learning, get supplanted by the belief that the fight against alleged racism is the most important part of a college's mission? How can it be that students are encouraged to reject books based on the skin color and sex of those books' authors? The causes are many, but one in particular stands out. Starting in the 1960s, many colleges began admitting black students with academic skills levels far below those of their non-preferred peers. Predictably, those alleged beneficiaries of racial preferences struggled in their classes. Had those students instead matriculated at a college where they shared the same level of academic preparation as their peers, they would have succeeded at rates comparable to those peers. Universities refuse to acknowledge the results of this academic mismatch. We can debate the cause of interracial academic disparities and how best to address them. But given their existence, you can have diversity 
or you can have meritocracy. You cannot have both. Colleges opted for diversity. And in so doing, they set in motion the suppression of free thought that bedevils universities today. The prime target of that suppression is discourse around race. It became taboo to acknowledge the skills gap. And therefore, it was imperative to come up with an alternative explanation for why black students admitted on diversity grounds were falling behind. Universities adopted a big lie, that they were systemically racist, as President Eisgruber affirmed in September 2020. Never mind that the very reason for academic mismatch was that universities were so desperate to get their number of black students up, even if so doing, imposed a terrible handicap on those students. Anyone who challenges that big lie will be a pariah at best and no longer employed at worst. To buttress the taboo against open discourse, campus ideologues came up with the hilarious conceit that college students are at mortal risk from ideas that they dislike, <clears throat> and that so-called hate speech, defined as ideas that challenge campus orthodoxies, is not constitutionally protected. <laughs> On virtually every American campus, a vast bureaucracy rose up to institutionalize the big lie of systemic racism. <coughs> Excuse me. The DEI bureaucracy was premised on the idea that black students were so under assault from racist faculty, administrators, and students that they needed official allies to protect them. I've plowed through reams of diversity boilerplate in my life. I can say that Princeton's boilerplate is among the most turgid that I have read, which was surprising in light of the school's lingering reputation of being more classically oriented. The following passage is typical. It comes from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion's 2019 report called Creating a Community of Practice. Princeton students, having been properly instructed by the ODI office, are supposed to, quote, integrate their understanding of identity, diversity, and inclusion with the context, community, and power dynamics in the world around them and engage in critical discourse about these concepts, utilizing a summative, critical understanding of their Princeton experiences. The report goes on in a similar vein for 12 pages with such pronouncements distributed in, in flow charts and, quote, outcomes rubrics in a false patina of scientific rigor. One theme is pervasive in the avalanche of Princeton's duplicative diversity reports. The goal of the diversity bureaucracy is to have students from, quote, marginalized communities feel, quote, respected, valued, and celebrated. Without these DEI bureaucrats, we are to believe so-called marginalized students would be disrespected, devalued, and disparaged. Leave aside for a moment whether any student should expect to feel respected, valued, and celebrated. I am confident that no adult at Princeton is disrespecting minority students. To the contrary, I am confident that Princeton's faculty and staff want minority students above all others to succeed. The same is true on every other American campus. Nevertheless, the DEI bureaucracy, with the support of leaders like President Eisgruber, relentlessly amplifies the false message of exclusion and disrespect. But what about this idea that students are entitled to feel, quote, respected, valued, and celebrated? Here's an alternative. Students should approach their college experience with fear and trembling. Are they worthy of these great books? Can their feeble understanding possibly do justice to the masterworks of the past? College is not about therapy and self-esteem. It is about filling students' empty noggins with as much knowledge of their civilizational inheritance as is possible in a mere four years. A course catalog should fill them with awe, desire, and self-doubt. Students earn the right to feel respected, valued, and celebrated by mastering a field with as much joy and determination as the Renaissance humanists. Until then, 
humility is in order. The attack on meritocracy has leapt from campuses to the world at large, most disturbingly in the STEM fields. Scientific journals proclaim that science and medicine are racist. Medical licensing boards are eliminating meritocratic standards that have a disparate impact on blacks. Medical schools admit, hire, and promote on the basis of race. The federal government doles out research grants in neurology and oncology on the basis of race and sets the research agenda according to which fields have the most black participants. That means moving funding away from basic science and into research on racial disparities in health. This preference for race over merit will encumber future medical progress and put lives at risk. It is imperative then that colleges lead the way back to colorblind standards of excellence. They should admit students and hire faculty based on their academic skills. Everything else is a distraction. Ideally, college admissions officers should be given pink slips and replaced with an objective process of selection. These self-important functionaries fancy themselves artistes, crafting little utopian communities. Harvard asks its desperate 16-year-old supplicants, quote, what about your maturity, character, leadership, self-confidence, warmth of personality, sense of humor, energy, concern for others, and grace under pressure? Oh, man, what admissions officer could pass such tests, much less inchoate adolescence? We have conferred on these obscure officials the power to determine the trajectory of American childhood with its desperate efforts to accumulate phony resume fodder that might spark the interest of a bored applications reader. Next on the chopping block should be every last diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucrat. There is no substantive knowledge or expertise involved in the DEI role. They are phony positions intended merely to signal that a college takes its anti-racism mission seriously. But that mission, as previously noted, is based on a lie. To the extent that underrepresented minorities feel out of place, it is only because they were admitted under the now illegal regime of racial preferences and were catapulted cruelly into a college for which they were academically mismatched. Indeed, the majority of the student services bureaucracy is equally superfluous. It is a vast but hollow edifice whose retention specialists and belonging coordinators exist only because of the effects of racial preferences. Their only accomplishment has been to drive up the cost of tuition to obscene levels. They too should get the ax. In the nationwide outpouring of support on college campuses for the terror attacks on Israel on October 7th, DEI officials at various schools were the first out of the gate to assert moral equivalence between Hamas and Israel. That is no coincidence. The sprawling intersectional coalition against Israel is a product of the anti-Western ideology that now dominates academia and that is nurtured by diversity bureaucrats. We must never blind ourselves to the grotesque violation of America's founding ideals that was slavery and segregation, a violation that made a mockery of America's alleged commitment to equality but it is a tragic waste of opportunity to read the past only through the lens of oppression rather than opening oneself to a vast and rich tradition whose accomplishments outweigh its flaws and whose flaws are exceeded by those of every other culture, past and present. Ignorance of the intellectual trajectory that led to the rule of law and the West's unimaginable prosperity puts those achievements at risk. But humanistic learning is also an end in itself. It is simply better to, escape, to have escaped one's narrow, petty self and entered minds far more subtle and vast than one's own than never to have done so. The Renaissance philosopher Marsilio Ficino said that a man lives as many millennia as are embraced by his knowledge of history. One could add, a man lives as many different lives as are embraced by his encounters with literature, music, and all the humanities and arts. These forms of expression allow us to see and feel things that we would otherwise never experience. Society on a 19th century feudalist state, for example, or the perfect crystalline brooks and mossy shades 
of pastoral poetry or the exquisite languor of a Chopin nocturne. These are four precious years for students to lose themselves in beauty, complexity, tragedy, and grandeur. Four years to encounter history's greatest minds grappling with mankind's greatest dilemmas. We should be down on our knees in gratitude for the sublimity that has been bequeathed us. Students will get the most out of this great college if they reject the tribalism of identity politics and let themselves roam free as individuals among ideas and eloquence. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. So we have ample time for questions. Alba and I are going to be doing mic running, alternating on either side. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll find you. We just ask that you keep your, bre your questions brief and to the point so that we can hear from Heather, OK? Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk. My name is uh, Danny Tenenbaum. I'm a grad student here. Um, you mentioned uh, regarding college admissions, the focus should be on uh, merit. And I think you said everything else is a distraction. What would you advise Dean Eisgruber to do about legacy admissions here at Princeton? I'm happy to get rid of them for just the sake of cleanness and purity. It's not, it's not worth having that fight. I, I think that I would just go purely on academic skills. Hi. Um, I'll put you on the spot and ask you to make a prediction. What do you think the effect of um, the affirmative action decision will be? Some people will think, uh, look, the bureaucracy is there, and uh, they'll find a way around it. And other people think, including people who have different views about what ought to happen, what they'd like to see happen, what, what's your prediction of uh, how it will play out? Um, is the status quo so entrenched that, uh, and you know, people, I'm a professor at the school, uh, they're very determined, right? So um, if there's a way around it, and maybe Roberts in some ways left the door open, uh, maybe it'll be found. On the other hand, maybe it will make a very significant difference. I know there's maybe no certain knowledge here, but what, what's your expectation? Well, I'll give you um, a, a warning or a self-disclosure. I'm a pessimist constitutionally by nature, so I have a tendency to expect the worst. And when I read the Roberts decision and got to the loophole that you uh, allude to, which says that in theory we're excluding the consideration of race in college admissions, except if a student talks in his college admissions essay about how race affected his life, of course we can't exclude consideration of that. That is a massive loophole. It, it refers to something in the, in the field known as holistic admissions, which is a, a practice that has already allowed many university systems in states that, in theory, banned uh, the consideration of race in government operations, including in universities, to consider, continue continu considering race. So I think, I mean, we've already had an a, a, a admirably honest college president of, of Louisville University who basically said, damn straight I'm going to take advantage of that loophole. Uh, I, you know, race is going to continue to be a massive part. And I think most other colleges, and Harvard was sort of, was not too um, coy right after the decision and basically saying it would do the same thing. So I think if, you know, there are some boards, I was last week at the University of North Carolina, they have a board of overseers that immediately declared unlike the university administration, we intend to abide by the law. And they may keep a close watch on their colleges. So there's some colleges that maybe were, maybe one in the whole country that was hoping to go that direction anyway. This will allow them to do so. But I think it's going to be a very, very long fight. And I mean, I try and game theory to myself how colleges are going to react with regards to using standardized tests. Um, because standardized tests allow them to race norm within groups and try and get the best students in every racial group. And you, in theory, they want more information rather than less. But if they continue to accept or even require standardized test scores, 
that creates a paper trail for uh, smoking out the fact that they are still using vast preferences in admission. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm delighted at the dilemma that this puts them to because they're as, as insanely obsessed with rank, you know, ranking to the nth degree of, of SAT scores outside of a preference context as anybody else. And to go test blind, it's very hard to come up with a, there's no other better test of um, college preparedness than SATs. So if they get rid of it, they're really gonna be flying blind. Um, hello, Heather. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Richard Golden, oh, yeah. undergraduate finally, class of 1991. We finally meet in person. Yes, finally meet in person. Big fan for a long time. Um, a part of an alumni um, discussion group, and we essentially have two factions. Faction one are the pessimists who believe that the university as an enterprise dedicated to truth and knowledge is irretrievably broken and damaged, and we might as well throw our hands up and forget it. There's a second group, the optimists, who think that if enough alumni and donors and faculty and parents all speak up, we can enact some significant changes. Um, I think the events in the last five weeks have shown some glimmers of hope, but I'm not sure how much. So I wanted to ask, where do you traditionally fall in between these two camps, and how have the last five weeks impacted your uh, perspective? Thank you. Uh, Richard, I, as you can tell, I believe in, with all of my soul in the humanist mission. And I think that universities are the ideal spot for passing on this civilizational legacy. There is eros. I fell in love with all of my professors in college because they had the thing which I yearned for, which was knowledge. And it is a very profound bound between teachers and students. And just to be in these, these campuses and the libraries, if they still exist, if the books haven't all been discarded for computer terminals, but, but it, can, it can be an extraordinarily uh, precious and thrilling experience to be in a, a university surrounded by scholars. So I have been so reluctant to give up on them but I get more and more despairing. But you're absolutely right to say that this last five weeks is a revelation in many ways. It's a revelation even for me, even for me who is about as pessimistic and jaundiced because I've been following this for 30 years and I kind of feel like I told you so, you know, the people that said, oh, you know, these, these snowflakes, once they get out into the real world, they'll have to toughen up their spine, you know, and there's the, the uh, hard, hard American software, whatever the um, uh, Washington, your colleague at the Washington Post uh, wrote about, that, you know, the, 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 the free market will have to shed and, and, and strip these idiot students of their narcissism. And it hasn't happened that way. Obviously, the students come bearing this, this bacillus, this poison of, of identity politics into, into marketplace, into their businesses. We have, but, but the degree of hatred, not just of anti-Semitism, but the broader coalition against Western civilization is just stunning. And the growing, the growing protests, the mobs of these students, the, the insanity of banners like Queers for Palestine that is like literal proof of how ignorant these students are. And we're supposed to listen to them as the tribunals of, of truth and of visionaries. Queers for Palestine, you try that in Palestine and see how far you get holding a gay pride march or, or doing trans ideology with five-year-olds, as they do in the LA Unified School District and in many schools. You try that. These people are utterly ignoramuses. It's been a wake-up call. And so the question is, will the donors, will the alumni have the ability 
to exercise their clout and the most, and frankly, is this going to be conceptualized, and I'm going to speak extremely um, frankly here, is it going to be conceptualized primarily as an anti-Semitism problem, or is it larger than that as an anti-Western civilization problem? I think it's the latter. I think there are traditional anti-Semites in these pro-Hamas coalitions. Uh, but I think that many of the intersectional groups there are, are almost too shallow to be traditional. I, I mean, it, it's coming from a much larger spot. It, this should be a wake-up call. The most positive thing that I've heard of and was from one of these University of Pennsylvania Wharton graduates. And they were early out of the gate in saying, we're doing the close the checkbook movement. And we're not giving another dollar to Penn or to Wharton unless you do something. And it's not really clear what they want them to do. But they have the idea, one of their demands is that the president of the University of Pennsylvania, Liz McGill, and the chairman of the board of trustees, Scott Bach, resign. They, the dissidents, will draft a new constitution for Penn that will embrace the Chicago principles, the Calvin principles, and one third source, and will state that we are in the business of meritocracy. We are in the business of academic excellence. We are not in the business of anything other than that, anti-racism, diversity. And the next president has to sign on to that constitution to get a job. And maybe it will just be Liz McGill sort of being recycled through. But, but the brilliance of this is it refounds an existing institution on sounder principles and gets around the problem of creating new institutions which are at a big handicap because they don't have the status equivalent of going to the legacy universities. And we all know the, the big thing for parents is not whether their kids learn anything, but whether they can brag at their cocktail party that their student is going to Cornell or Amherst or Brown, uh, you know, or University of California or even Princeton. Um, so, so that's that. That's it. it it's, it takes the status of an existing institution and reams it out. Now, I got all excited when this was described to me, and then somebody else that's part of his movement said, "Ain't going to happen. We're not going to get rid of McGill. We're not going to get rid of Scott Box." So, I don't know, but, but. More and more, I'm hearing of more and more alumni groups that are getting very um, angry. MIT, the organizing is primarily the Jewish alumni, and they are spitting mad. And they feel like the Jewish students at MIT are under literal threat of their lives, whether that's true or not, I don't know, because the safetyist rhetoric has been so debased. Uh, and so they've got a real crying wolf problem. Uh, maybe in this case, there really is a safety threat. But, but in any case, it, it seems to be, it, it's growing, not dying down. And so we need to keep the public aware of what's going on. And, and maybe this will be the moment where people finally wake up to the fact that we have created a monster with this diversity ideology, with the victim ideology, with the oppression ideology that is ignorant, it does not understand global realities, and it certainly does not understand the past. Hello. My name is Warner Graff. I'm a local resident, friend of the program. Um, my first job out of college was at Procter & Gamble, and it was 1986, and, and I was part of the first team that uh, put together diversity seminars for the company. It was like right, right as they started to evolve and so on. And we were very proud of them. They, and there, there was basically three tenets. One was we provide a history of, of racial relations. And then we kind of impose an obligation on uh, like the majority folks that they are aware of things that could be detrimental to folks that were um, you know, minority and detract from their performance. Odd jokes, you know, putting a mechanics calendar up you know, in an office 
in what calendar? Like a mechanics calendar, like like women in bikinis type of thing. You know, relatively benign stuff, but stuff that people don't think about, right? And then the other the other obligation was on the minority folks not to let people drain your power, you know, simply because something happened in the workplace that. Not um, let people may, drain you, their power. Did yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. The, the the analogy they used to use the metaphor was that you come into work with a bathtub of power. And somebody could do something like, say, an off-color joke, and you feel less than, and therefore they've pulled the drain in your bathtub and, and your personal power. And then you become silent in meetings. You don't participate in a after events, you know, that type of thing where you can network. So there was an obligation on them to be a little bit more, uh, you know, I guess tough skin for lack of a better, but it was an empowerment thing. The whole, the whole thing revolved around, can we get the most out of our team, right? Are we, are we uplifting everybody to the extent of their potential? It was all underpinned by free speech. Um, the, the thing that really bothers me with what's going on and what you just described is that there are very real punitive uh, results of people that talk like you would talk in a corporate atmosphere. You know, you're self-made. You, you're, you're, you know, you, you, you've got the ability to do this without getting hurt too badly. And I can tell you, if you're if you're working at a university, if you're working at a corporation, if you're working on a board, uh, not for profit, this is all verboten, you know. And and I think that's you know I, when I see Palestine, you know, queers for Palestine, I almost almost kind of celebrate. I mean, they're allowed to make fools of themselves in the public square. I don't view that as a negative. Right. Yeah. Okay. And and the and the discussions like I can remember, and I apologize. I know I'm I'm trying to give you context to the the I promise the end point question that I have, but. When we went through these sessions at Procter and Gamble, they would they would play a speech from Martin Luther King, and I would say, "Man, that's intellectually powerful. That's great." And the black guy next to me is crying, right? That's a whole different worldview, and you have to acknowledge it, and you have to you have to understand where they're coming from to maximize everybody's, you know, participation and, and contribution. But that's not where we are anymore. It's all around oppression. It's all around victimhood. It's all around narcissism. It's this narcissistic movement of, of your feelings, like you said, it's just, but to me, the underpinning on the, on the first part is missing on the second, which is the free speech piece. And how do we get back so that folks aren't intimidated? They're not like real world punished, fired, demoted, not promoted, and so on, because they're talking the way that you just clearly spoke, you know, here at the forum. Well, you have to not be frightened of being called a racist because that is what will happen if you do say why we don't have absolutely racially proportionate institutions today. It's not because of systemic racism. It's because of a lingering skills gap. As I say, it, when you have 66% of black 12th graders not possessing even partial mastery of basic math skills at a 12th grade level, which is defined as arithmetic and reading a graph. And when the number of black 12th graders with advanced math skills on a national sample is too small to show up statistically, it's preposterous to look at Google and say you don't have 13% black nanophysicists or, or, or computer technologists because you're racist. They're not there. You know, at most, the STEM fields have 1% one, 1 of their PhD graduates each year are black, if that. So the pipe, it's the pipeline problem. It's not a racism problem. But as long as we can't talk about that, then racism is the only allowable explanation. And as long as racism is the only allowable explanation for racial disparities, the left wins. And it is all coming down. I can tell you, I follow this. It is all coming down. What's happening in classical music, at museums, in, in theater, in STEM, in policing. I mean, what's going on today with the progressive prosecutors not prosecuting whole categories of law is all because of disparate impact. It's because if they do so in a colorblind constitutional fashion, it will have a disparate impact on black criminals, not because the law is racist, but because there's a higher rate of crime in the black community and there's also a higher rate of black victimization. And nobody, the Black Lives Matter activists don't give a damn about black victims. Since the George Floyd race riots, 
The police have backed off, and predictably, we've got the largest increase in homicide in our nation's history. Last year, a 75% increase in violent victimization. Black children have been gunned down in their front yards, backyards, in their beds, at birthday parties, jumping on trampolines, in their parents' cars, in these insane drive-by shootings. Al Sharpton and Benjamin Crump have never said their names once. There has never been a protest against those black children victims because they've been shot, not by the police, not by so-called white supremacists, but by other blacks. And therefore, their lives have no value for furthering the race narrative. Um, so the idea that everything today is defined by racism, and that's the reason for racial disparities, whether it's in meritocratic institutions or, or the criminal justice system, is just wrong. And we have to be able to, to Talk about that. Um, as far as diversity, corporate diversity training, I don't know, PG&E, P&G was a absolute pioneer in this field. I wrote about our Roosevelt Thomas, one of the earliest, I would call him a charlatan, uh, diversity trainers. He, his whole thing was valuing diversity, or no, managing diversity, and then it became, of course, you have to have all the name changes, which is endlessly fruitful for developing new sinecures, so then it became valuing diversity. And I remember he was talking about, well, this was in the 90s, that expectations of promptness are a white value. And so you have to discard those if you want to value diversity in the workplace. I don't think that's a particularly helpful uh, way to train managers. Um, so f maybe there was a time when it was necessary, and, and certainly, again, I am never going to deny the gratuitous cruelty of white Americans for most of our history. The fact that we were white supremacists, that the white identity was created with the seeming need at every possible opportunity to put blacks in their place. At a time when in the 20th century, when blacks were trying their best to incorporate, they were following bourgeois norms. When you see the, the great singers, the great musicians, Ella Fitzgerald and, and Duke Ellington dressed to the nines, participating in the American experiment, and they still were excluded. It's absolutely heartbreaking. That was our reality, and whether there were still vestiges of that at PG&E in the 1980s, maybe, I'm not persuaded, uh, but that isn't our reality today. Nobody, it, would, it was unimaginable that we could change as much as we have, but we really have. My impression is that whites today yearn to be post-racial, and many blacks do as well. The, the demoralization, the demonization of the cops ignores those good, law-abiding residents of inner-city neighborhoods who come to the police community meetings every month and beg for more police, who are trying to run businesses and can't because they get ripped off all the time by kids that have not been socialized. Those people who are living up to the American ideal, they do not get heard in the public discourse, and instead, we are eulogizing the thug George Floyd. He is our civil rights martyr today, and that's a tragic downward trajectory. Up here, yes, hello. So I do agree that <clears throat> Merit, uh, meritocracy is the, is a. I'm the, sorry, the, I can't, I've got, my bad of hearing, so you're gonna speak. Oh, so meritocracy for admissions into the uh, college experience is, a, is, is, the, is the way things should be, should be. However, the, the, the basis, the, the, the root of meritocracy is from our primary and secondary educations. And um, if you look at simply uh, the primary and secondary education in Princeton versus Trenton, there's a, quite a disparity and wealth becomes part of it. So in this country, it seems to me that meritocracy is a function, some sense of function of wealth. 
And um, affirmative action is a placeholder in some sense to, to sort of be there until we can work out this, uh, this fundamental uh, dis, uh, disconnect in, 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 in wealth. Um, and if we do eliminate um, uh, affirmative action, is there, have you given any thought to what, do we need a replacement for it? Uh, um, or is this something we can just, uh, yeah, yeah, do we need a replacement for, for? Well, first of all, we've been doing a placeholder for about five decades. You know, it was challenged at, at Bakke versus the University of California back in the 70s. Uh, and we have, if anything, the preferences have grown. So the skills gap has not improved thanks to racial preferences. My objection to preferences is not, it's, it's not the usual equity grounds that they're unfair to whites and Asians. It's they're unfair to the recipients of preferences. And let me take this out of the race context and put it in the gender context. If MIT decides it wants more female undergraduates, and so it admits me with a math SAT of 600 on an 800 point scale, because it's gotta get its female quota up, and my peers admitted without preferences on their academic skills average about 800 on an 800 point scale on their math SATs, What's going to happen to me my freshman year at MIT in my algebra class or my, my calculus or pre-calculus class? The teaching is going to be pitched to the average of my peers where people have already mastered pre-calculus or calculus. And I'm going to struggle to keep up. Now, if instead I had gone, instead of MIT, to a school where my peers had 600s on their math SATs, which is a respectable score. If I'd gone to Boston College or Boston University, I would have had the same chance to graduate as my peers because the teaching would have been pitched to that class average. And what we see, and, and, but at MIT, I'm gonna struggle, I'm gonna fall behind, and guess what happens next? The diversity bureaucrat, bureaucrat, bureaucracy sweeps up and tells me that if I'm struggling in my classes, if I'm feeling out of place, if I'm feeling like I can't keep up, I'm the victim of the patriarchy. I'm the victim of a rape culture. It is because they don't understand my identity. And I'm going to be given an excuse for my academic difficulties. Uh, if instead I'd gone to Boston College or Boston University, which are perfectly respectable schools, the, the elitism, the snobbery in the racial preferences discourse is nauseating. The conceit is, is that if you don't get, if you're a black student and don't get catapulted into Princeton, your life is over. Uh, well, if that's the case, why should anybody go to a state school. If it's over for that black student, it's over for everybody else that doesn't go. Why don't we just close them all down and everybody go to the Ivy Leagues? Um, the fact is, is that when students are the so-called beneficiaries of preferences, and this has been studied at Duke, uh, an economist there, Peter Archidichiano, did a extraordinarily complicated uh, empirical analysis, it turns out that more black male freshmen enter Duke wanting to major in STEM than white male freshmen wanting to major in STEM. But by the end of the four years, the STEM graduates are overwhelmingly white and Asian. The black intending STEM majors have attrited out into different fields because they were admitted with over a standard deviation below in SATs. Perfectly predictable that they would not be able to keep up. But again, had they gone to a North Carolina University, Charleston, a perfectly respectable school where they were matched with their peers, they would have graduated with a STEM field. Preferences give us fewer STEM scientists who are black than more. 
I think it's a cruel policy. You're, you're putting people at a disadvantage, all for the narcissism of campus administrators so they can look out at their little cultivated diverse faces. The reality is this, without racial preferences, the same number of black students would go to college, they would just go to college under the same conditions as everybody else, which is matched to the colleges that they've been admitted to, given the same odds of succeeding as everybody else, as opposed to be given much lower odds because of being admitted with a standard deviation in most cases below those of your peers. That is not helping, that is hurting. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Sebastian. I'm a senior at the university. Um, I, I'm interested in, it seems like during the talk you identified sort of two goals of the university. One of them being, I appreciated the reference to Petrarch, you know, sort of this, this love of learning and of the fine arts um, and really, you know, having students who, um, who are awed by uh, the course offerings and the stacks and all these things. Um, and then the second goal is to have universities be places where uh, places sort of where students are pursuing academic excellence and where the students who are admitted, like at a place like Princeton, are academically excellent across the board. From my experience here, it doesn't seem like those two goals necessarily overlap. Oftentimes you have students who are very, very academically qualified, who are deeply uninterested in actually learning. How do you, how do you reconcile the two? And you know, how does maybe giving the admissions office a little bit more room to admit students who aren't admittedly as qualified on paper, but who really will thrive and contribute to an environment like Princeton? Well, if I trusted academic admissions officers, admissions officers to make that judgment, maybe I would be willing to rethink my revulsion for them, but I just don't. I, I don't believe they can make those character judgments. Uh, who are these people? Who are they to make these judgments about character? It's ridiculous. Um, so, those students who are academically motivated, again, they'll go to a college. I, I mean, obviously Princeton is gorgeous and, and it has a legacy. I hope that its faculty are still committed to humanistic learning and are not involved in deconstructing it and, and showing subtext, which they will only do against Western civilization. I can guarantee you that they are still studying Chinese and Indian and African civilizations with respect, putting the best foot forward with aesthetic respect, only the West gets subjected to deconstructive acid. Um, but I, I, I understand if they're, so they've, they've got high test scores, but they just want their job at I've got two Goldman Sachs people here. I'm not going to disparage Goldman Sachs, but there is a certain, uh, I know that I, I acknowledge that there's a certain uh, pure job motivation. Um, I, I, I think the downside risk of, of the giving discretion to the academic admissions officers is just too great. I'm, I'm willing to go on a, on a numbers-based system and, and have it work out. And I would say it's up to the faculty to stop disparaging this legacy. Every, every autumn, the faculty should be out there saying, take my course, greatness lies here. If you do not read these books before you die, you will have led an impoverished life. Instead, they're tongue-tied. They cannot say, you must read this. They can't even tell students what courses they must take, which is an enormous abdication of intellectual responsibility. You guys don't know enough. I didn't know enough. I was an undergraduate in one of the great American history departments in the country in the 1970s. I didn't take a single history course except for one intellectual history course because my faculty did not have the backbone and the, and the self-belief to say, 
you must take European history, American history, and of course, if you have time, of course take world history. But I didn't even do that. To leave it up to student discretion is ridiculous, but there is practically no school in the country that has meaningful uh, core curriculum any longer. You guys just don't know to pick. I remember this, this Yale alum, this father of a Yale student bragged to me that his son, a freshman, was taking a course in the history of torture. And I was supposed to be so impressed by that. And my view is, come on, tell me, does he know the history of Europe first? Does he know the history of constitutional government, of freedom from the monarchy? Then maybe he can specialize in the history of torture. But of course, that student left to himself is going to choose something sexy like that. Worthless, utterly worthless. Hi, I'm, I'm troubled by your focus on academic excellence as being the sole criterion for admission. So what if I think that someone has more potential but has 10 points, and, and you seem to be focusing somewhat on SAT scores as the evidence of academic excellence. So what if based on interviews and life story, I think somebody has much more potential, but they have 10 points lower combined SAT scores. Am I prohibited from taking them? What if I think that having some veterans in my university might make my students actually better fitted for society when they graduate, but no veterans are in the top 4,000 people SAT scores who applied? Can I deviate 15 points to take them? Well, again, how does it... Why do you trust a college admissions officer to be able to make those judgments about potential? Because it is the, it is the best uh, predictor of ability to handle college work. There's nothing else. If the University of California Faculty Senate did a study about whether to keep the SAT or not, because Well, first of all, uh, when we're talking about racial preferences, it's much I'm larger. About okay. I I I have to stick by my principle. You know, I've, if I if I concede that, uh, I don't know where we draw the line. You know, fifteen. Okay, what about twenty? What about thirty? Well, then, but again, those students. They will go to college someplace. And so you want them distributed around. It then becomes kind of this zero sum uh, activity where people are fighting over the same group of, of diverse students. And I'm using diverse here in a broader sense. So that's the 15 point lower score. Well, you're OK. I, again, I. The alternative for me, reading the, the transcripts of these admissions officers, the people at UNC who talked about, well, you know, I want our little brown students to come in. Let's give a merit. Too bad this little brown person can't get qualify for a merit scholarship, but let's try and get her in anyway. Uh, reading how these admissions officers describe their role, I did not come away with a lot of, of respect for them. So I understand the ideal, again, of this utopian community with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, and we all enjoyed our college experience, and, and we had felt and, and frankly, you know, I, I thought that the, the strategy of SFFA v. Harvard, which was to play up the Asian card, and they wanted to make it about anti-Asian discrimination in favor of whites, which was a clever strategy to get it out of the black-white context. I thought that that was specious, that 
what was going on was not so much discrimination against Asians per se, and they, I don't believe that the Harvard admissions officers really did think that Asian students were, oh, here we go, um, were less interesting. I think it was just that they were taking up slots that, that Harvard wanted to use for underrepresented minorities. Nevertheless, since then I have heard things that make me think that maybe that was right, that there's a sense that if we go from the top of the score, it's all gonna be Asian math wonks that aren't particularly interesting. And I, I just disagree with that. Uh, the degree of classical music, mastery of instruments. So I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stick to a pure position just because I, I don't trust these guys, I really don't. Time for two more questions, and they're both going to come, I think, from this side. So thank you very much for being here, and thank you very much for your fearless fealty to free speech. So important. I believe you've written on, when we talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion genre, you've talked about uh, perhaps the feminization of the enforcement. And uh, based on one of those articles that you wrote, I went into the Princeton DEI annual report, and I think I surmised or found that uh, it's about 75%, 70 to 75% of our DEI officers, the ones that I could determine, are females. Is this the case uh, around the country? If so, why is it occurring, and what are the implications of this? It's part of the great feminization of the university. 75% of all Ivy League presidents are female now. The bureaucracy in universities is like two-thirds female. In many fields, it's majority female. Obviously, with the student body, it's majority female. And we know uh, poll after poll after poll shows that on the axis of academic freedom, universities about the pursuit of truth and knowledge versus the so-called values of safety, of protecting students from uh, ideas that make them feel uncomfortable or unsafe, there is a clear, repeated distinction between males and females. Overwhelmingly, males value academic freedom, uh, free speech at the cost of student safety, whatever that means. And females value making people feel safe, uh, protecting them from dangerous ideas. There are, on average, differences between males and females psychologically. There are exceptions, obviously. Individual males who have more typically female predilections and individual females uh, who show the male traits of aggression, competitiveness, uh, a greater awareness of, of cost-benefit risk analysis. But saying that truth that on average you can, and psychology is known for decades about male-female differences, saying that truth got James Damore fired from Google because he said that maybe it's not discrimination against females that is the reason why we're not 50-50 male-female in, um, in our tech and computer science and engineering departments, but different predilections and the fact he, he, the poor, innocent, naive used one of the big five traits, which has been, again, something known in psychology for decades. One of the big five personality traits is something called neuroticism, which means risk aversion, you know, greater anxiety, greater neuroses. Females score much higher uh, on the neuroticism trait. That's just a fact. And he used the trait, the word neuroticism, of course, the New York Times and everybody picked up on that. But yes, I would say the dominance, the growing dominance of females in the university bureaucracy has profound implications for how universities think about themselves. And the move away from free speech goes hand in hand with the feminization of the university. And it is no surprise that the DEI bureaucracy is so uh, heavily female. Uh, they, are, they are the ones that are invested in the victim narrative. 
Thank you so much for being here. I, I had this question before that exchange happened, but I'm curious, do you try to have, have you had debates with people? Have I what? Had debates, like live active debates, because I, with your knowledge base, your research, your ability to articulate what you believe, this is a relatively receptive audience. I'm wondering if you have these conversations with you know, less receptive audiences, because voices like yours, I think need, that, that exchange you just had right there, that kind of conversation would be so, I think, impactful. Well, the MIT Free Speech Alliance wanted to create a debate on uh, the DEI bureaucracy, like resolved the DEI, bureauc DEI bureaucracy should be uh, eliminated. And they spent months. First, they went within MIT to try to find somebody who would debate me and the, my partner. And they couldn't find anybody at MIT. Then they reached out across the country to try and get academics who would do it, MI, it either within DEI bureaucracies or more broadly. Couldn't find anybody. They finally had to bring in these two female diversity consultants who you know, do little diversity trainings out in the corporate world. Um, so it's, it's hard. The last time I had one, uh, I can't remember. I mean, I've done Federalist Society things, but those are generally freestanding speeches. So they can just go underground, you know, and say, we're not going to debate these things. Why should they? They've got the monopoly, you know? They don't, it's like Trump saying, I'm not going to debate. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't need to. Uh, he can set his terms, and the, and the academic bureaucracy is the same way. Thank you, Heather. Uh -uh. Thank you. I'd like to thank Heather for very illuminating remarks, and also I'd like to thank all the people who asked questions. They were terrific questions. It's a good audience. We're glad you came. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.